Apple has announced their new 24-inch iMac running on Apple Silicon at their Spring Loaded event. The computer is available for pre-order today, April 30th. Let's have a look at the current Apple M1 processor lineup and see if it's ready for pro workflow. And if you need to get one, what configuration should you buy for the new iMac? I'm Art and Art is right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. To answer the question whether Apple Silicon is ready for pro workflow, it would ultimately depends on the type of creative pro work that you do. For instance, for video work, these Apple Silicons are fantastic for that. They have been optimizing their processor for years for any type of video encoding, decoding, and it does an amazing job. In fact, sometimes better than the Intel counterpart. Especially if you're using Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve, you're pretty much going to be set. If you're a graphic designer, even running on Rosetta 2, many of the graphic design program will work just fine on the Apple Silicon processor. If you are a pro photographer like I am, and your workflow involves Lightroom Classic and Photoshop, the experience can vary quite a bit. Running on Rosetta 2, Photoshop and Lightroom Classic does work majority well. However, with Lightroom Classic, there are certain tasks that does take longer on the Apple Silicon, such as HDR merge, or a big panoramic merge. And when you try to really load in a large file in Photoshop, well, it does perform okay. It's not the best and it's not the most optimized. Now, some of you may say that Adobe at this point in time does have Photoshop running as a beta for Apple Silicon. Yes, there are still some limitations and you're still running on the beta software. So for photography, it's not fully yet optimized, especially if you're still in Adobe ecosystem. So here's the thing. I'm going to approach this mostly from a pro photography workflow from where I stand right now. So if you're in my boat, this will be a great guide for you. Here's the thing. If you're a pro photographer and you need a machine in your production workflow, and let's say your Mac just quit and died completely today and you need to get a new machine. As counterintuitive as this may seem, I still recommend that you go out and get an Intel machine. And the best thing that you can do is look at Apple refurb site because you're going to save a lot of money there. If you run this as a business and you're in a full production workflow, you need a machine that works 100% on day one. So the Intel is going to be best right now. And the other thing is that if you run this as a business, well, that machine is a write off down the road. You can certainly sell off the machine. And when the software and processors are really more designed for pros, then you can really jump into the Apple Silicon bandwagon. Then, I mean, if you really think about this, Display calibration software just literally become available for Apple Silicon just only a few weeks ago. So things are coming along, but they may not be coming along as fast as we want them to. All right. This being said, let's have a look at the Apple Silicon lineup right now. We have the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro 13 inch. Those are great machine and I do have the MacBook Air in my studio to run testing. You can upgrade them to 16 gigabytes of memory and you can upgrade the processor to the 8 CPU, 8 GPU core. That's perfectly great. The limitation that I have with those machines right now for Pro Workflow is the two USB ports on the side. I need more ports than that. And if you are a pro like I am, you will know right away that having those two ports is very limiting. For instance, many of us would have multiple hard drives being linked up to the system and having two ports is really a big limitation factor. I'll give you one scenario right now. So for instance, I use a 16 inch Intel MacBook Pro that has four USB ports, USB type C ports on the side. At the end of the event that I photograph, I would photograph anywhere between, I would say four cameras at the minimum, if not six cameras, depending on how many photographers we have or how many shooters we have. So let's say we're photographing four cameras. We have four memory cards. At the end of the event, my workflow is we'll download everything to a laptop, and then we'll put all those images onto an SSD that I would give to my associate so that they can edit those offsite. So the thing is this, with the current MacBook Pro, let's say it takes around seven minutes to download each card. I can plug all those cards in at once on my 16 inch MacBook Pro and download them all at the same time. Therefore, that seven minutes, I'm downloading four cards. On these current machines, which I don't think they're really designed for Pro right now, but if you want to use them for Pro workflow, you can. You can only download two cards at a time. So if each card takes seven minutes, those seven minutes you're able to download two. So now you're spending at least 14 minutes, not to mention the time plugging, unplugging. So you're spending about at least 15 to 16 minutes just to download those four cards, doubling the amount of time. Not only that, 
Afterwards, you have to copy the file over onto an SSD and that takes another 10 minutes or so. Now, the thing is this, if you photograph more than four cards or four cameras, that time is gonna start to increase the time that you have to spend on site. And the reason why we do all those type of downloading is because we shoot with high res cameras. We don't want to spend the time to upload things to the cloud and everything because let's face it, you know, internet works great. However, when you need to upload 40 megapixel camera files up and thousand of them to the cloud and share between your group, it gets really cumbersome really quickly. Okay, so that's my thought about these portable machines. I don't think they're fully ready for pro workflow yet, at least for me anyway. If you fall into the scenario that I am, you'll be limited right away. However, if you're fine downloading one card at a time, then that's okay for you. However, I don't think that that's the way how we can use our time efficiently. Let me put it this way. As a pro, I'm always looking at how I can shave seconds off my files because if you're dealing with, let's say a thousand files, if you can save a second out of every single of those files, you're saving about close to 17 minutes of your time. So I'm always thinking in seconds and not minutes and hours. All right, that being said, let's take a look at their other machines. For instance, the Mac Mini, what do I think about that? I think the Mac Mini M1 does bring the experience closer to Pro. However, there was one big limitation that I have, and that is the gigabit internet. I am not able to get 10 gigabit ethernet and I'm already running those in my network. Now, if you don't fall into the type of categories that I am right now with all these specific needs, you're gonna be fine. But with this recent announcement, Apple has also upgraded their Mac Mini so that you can now configure this with 10 gigabit ethernet by adding $100 to it. And I think this is a very fantastic thing to have because it makes a big difference with regards to storage. Now these Mac mini, you're still limited on the amount of maximum RAM that you can configure for the system. 16 gigabyte is the max there, so there are some limitations. Also the IO ports on the back on the Mac mini, I think is much better than their portable machines. However, you're still somewhat limited. So you get two USB ports that are type A and you get the two USB type C Thunderbolt ports on the machine. Somewhat limited still, but you do get the extra HDMI output. And in my testing, I already told you that the HDMI output on the Mac Mini works fine. You can still get the equivalent of full range and you can run the calibration on that without any issues at all. All right, so now let's talk about the big announcement that Apple has just made, and that is their 24 inch iMac. It's still running on the Apple M1 processor. And if you are a pro, the best thing that I told you was in the beginning is to still go out and get the Intel machine today, especially if you're in a full production workflow and you need a functioning machine on day one. However, if you are a pro photographer like I am and you want to get into Apple Silicon right away and you're comparing all these machine lineup, the best machine that I would recommend right now is the Mac Mini because it does offer you more flexibility for the IO ports and it also has the extra HDMI on there so you can link multiple displays a little bit easier. In addition, because you can configure it to 10 gigabit ethernet, that is a big deal, especially if you're using that on your network already. However, if you're looking at iMac, here's my recommendation. You will see on the iMac configuration that there are three tiers machine. There is a, I would say the base model, the mid tier, and I would say the bump up or the high end model. So we take a look at this mid tier right here. The only difference between this and the one up is the storage. It goes from 256 to 512. Let's have a look at one thing though. I would definitely not recommend that any pro get the base model for a few reasons. Number one is that you want to get the maximum amount of CPU and GPU cores right out of the gate. This way, the computer would have more system performance down the road when the software get updated. So should the software becomes more demanding or requires more processing power, you have the power ready for future usage. Not only that though, if we take a look at the machine configuration right now, the base model only comes with two Thunderbolt USB Type 4 ports. That's pretty much it. You don't have anything else and you will also not get the gigabit ethernet that's on the power brick too, that's using the MagSafe connector. So some limitations there. The recommendation is to go with the mid or high end models because you will get two additional USB 3.0 that are Type-C ports. So that's going to help a lot if you connect a lot of the devices to your machine. I mean, let me put it this way. A lot of the pros I consult with, including myself, we have multiple peripherals that we link up to our computer. We have hard drives, and that is many of them. We have Wacom tablet or a Cintiq or whatever that may be, and we have other peripherals that we link up to this. 
Regardless of however you link this up though, you're probably going to look at getting either a full-fledged dock that can be a multifunction device or a USB hub that can expand the UXB on these machines. But regardless of that, I would recommend getting the mid-tier one because you're going to get four ports total and that's going to expand the usability. Let's go back to this page. I already talked a little bit about processor. With regards to the memory, all of them are configured with eight gigabytes of memory. But I want to emphasize this, that there are different opinions out there about the system RAM on these machines. And yes, I will say that these machine does a really great job managing RAM and sharing RAM between the CPU and GPU. But nonetheless, it is a shared unified memory, meaning that if the GPU is using a lot of RAMs, your CPU is not getting that full eight gigabyte. So if you're doing pro workflow, I would definitely recommend going to 16 immediately because Photoshop and Lightroom will definitely be able to utilize those RAMs that are on the machine unified or not. And the other thing about getting a bigger RAM too is that you're minimizing swapping on the machine. You're not stopping that entirely and swapping is pretty much when your memory gets full and it can't write to the memory anymore. What it does is that it takes some of the parts of the memory that are not used quite often or the older files and it writes it onto the SSD. If you've been following and use on the Apple Silicon, there has been talk about a lot of memory swapping, a lot of SSD writes. So the way how you can also prevent that doing this in a pro workflow is to get the 16 gigabyte RAM. And that's going to help minimize a lot of those things from happening. At the end of the day, swapping will happen even though you have much more RAM in your system, it's still going to do the swap and the SSD are gonna get written to. I wouldn't necessarily lose sleep over how much SSD get written to, but the other thing that you want to consider with these machines is that getting a larger SSD also means you have more room for the computer to swap files to and also more room for you to store things on your SSD. At the very minimum for pro workflow, I recommend going with at least 512 gigabytes of memory. Even though if you store everything off your computer, it's always good to have extra memory or extra SSD in your computer so that there's extra room for these programs to write to the file, especially if you're using this for Photoshop scratches and everything. It's just much better to not run out of it. Because all these machines, similar to all the Apple machines that have been built recently, they're mostly soldered to the board, meaning that the way how you configure it now, it's pretty much what you're gonna have five, 10 years down the road. And well, if the machine lasts 10 years, but here's the thing though, you can't really easily go in and upgrade the SSD or upgrade the RAM on here because they're soldered. You need to really take everything apart and do really like ball joint micro soldering, which is not easy to do and they're really expensive. There you have it. My recommended iMac configuration for Creative Pro. If you're getting the Mac Mini, the same would apply. And I would encourage you to upgrade to 10 gigabit Ethernet, giving you more flexibility in the long run. I'm going to get a 24 inch iMac mid-tier into the studio to run testing and benchmark and a whole lot of calibrations. And yes, I will be linking it to multiple different displays and giving you my feedback about the port, what works, what doesn't, and how you can get around some of those limitations. So make sure you stay tuned to the channel for that. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Give this a like, subscribe and hit on the bell if you're new. And until next time, in art we trust. <laughs>